You're listening to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast, episode 22, hosted by me, Robert Plotkin. Today I'm going to be speaking with Michael Harris, author of Solitude in Pursuit of a Singular Life in a Crowded World, and The End of Absence, Reclaiming What We've Lost in a World of Constant Connection. In both of these books, he examines why our experience of solitude has become so impoverished and how we may grow to love it again. We are extremely pleased to welcome Michael Harris to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. In today's episode of the Technology for Mindfulness podcast, I'll be interviewing author Michael Harris, who will talk about the benefits of solitude and how we can regain moments of solitude in the midst of our busy lives. And as you'll hear in the interview, one of the things he'll say is that we don't necessarily need to radically change our lives or move to the mountains in order to insert moments of solitude into our lives. Uh, He gives some tips, and I'd like to mention a few other suggestions for how we can find time for ourselves, even if we have an otherwise busy, hectic, and very connected day, week, month, or life. At any moment during your day, you can see if you have the opportunity to turn your technology off, turn your phone off. If you can't turn it off, to put it to sleep, mute it, put it in do not disturb mode, uh, at least put it somewhere where you can't hear it or see it. Depending on your circumstances, you may not be able to do some or all of these things, but if you're aware of what all of the various options are, and periodically throughout the day or when it occurs to you, if you consider whether you have any of those options, you might be surprised to find that you do have some way available to you to decrease your connection to the technology, perhaps temporarily suspend your connection to other people in a way that helps put you more in touch with yourself, your thoughts, your feelings, your sensations, your intentions. If you're on the train, you might be on a crowded train packed with other people. But at that moment, ask yourself, is it possible to close my eyes? Is it possible for me to focus inwardly on my own thoughts or sensations? And in the midst of that physical connection with many people, sight, sound, touch, find some focus on yourself and create for yourself an experience of solitude within a crowd, even if it's temporary. So that's the suggestion for today. Uh, It's a way of helping to recognize that we don't necessarily always have to do radical things to practice mindfulness, or in this case, to obtain a feeling of solitude. We don't have to go to the mountains. We don't have to go on a retreat. We don't have to even attend a class. We don't necessarily have to engage in a formal meditation practice, sitting on a cushion necessarily, we may be able to take advantage of whatever time or place we are in at the moment in the middle of a day without a formal setting or practice and create that experience of solitary mindfulness that can help us then reemerge into our connectedness with other people and with technology in a way that's energized, motivated, and refreshed. So with that said, I hope you enjoy the interview with author 
Michael Harris, who'll be talking about solitude. Hi, Michael, and welcome to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. Thanks for having me. I'd like to talk to you about the topic of uh, your two more recent books, which is solitude and how we've really mostly lost that experience of and value for solitude. Uh, In our culture today, it seems like there's a very, very strong value in being connected with other people. You actually called it uh, that an ecosystem of obsessive connection. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, Could you talk a little bit about what you mean by that? And uh, in in part, because it may be surprising or a a bit unfamiliar for people to think about connecting with other people uh, in a negative way. You talk a little bit about, you know, what you see the problem as being with obsessive connection. Well, it's not that connecting with other people is itself a problem. Um, it's that we have an ecosystem of technologies uh, that have hijacked in some ways um, a very basic and healthy human drive. So I I like to think of things in terms of uh, diet, actually. If you you think about, um, let's say, those basic human uh, interests in caloric intake or salts and sugars, right? very important mm-hmm. things to consume. Then uh, in the 20th century, uh, in America in particular, uh, you get a, a series of companies that have figured out how to hijack those drives and give you a, a fast food uh, uh, equivalent of, of uh, nutrition. Uh, by the end of the 20th century, we're starting to wise up to that and people start to uh, design their food diets a bit more. Uh, so what I'm arguing is that on a on a media level, we are in the 1950s. That uh, a, a boom of of technology companies have figured out how to hijack the the drive for social connectivity that is so important in human life, um, and has exacerbated it uh, to a point where it becomes unhealthy. Uh, where uh, we become sort of social gluttons to to a degree. And I think that the next stage will be uh, figuring out how to design that healthy media diet. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what the, what the harms are of overconnection itself. I mean, we're certainly familiar with harms of advertising, marketing to people, or fake news more recently, mm-hmm. uh, you know, actually providing people with false information or misleading information. What is it, though, about too much connection that's harmful to people? Well, I, I tend to think of it in, in positive terms uh, rather than negative. So I, I think about what, what is it about time alone or, or separation that is worth safeguarding. Um, so if I can just maybe flip the, the question around. Sure. Um, I, I would say you know, the, the value of solitude comes in three parts. Um, firstly, that's where we really get fresh ideas. It's where we, uh, we, we have eureka moments in moments of solitude or separation. Uh, it's very hard to have a, a eureka moment while you're uh, crowdsourcing your thoughts. Mm-hmm. Um, secondly, self-knowledge. So uh, awareness of what you believe independent from what the crowd believes. Um, and then the third thing that solitude does uh, sort of paradoxically is I think it actually helps you become closer to other humans. So if you, and, and that's the part that people usually have the hardest time with. But I, I do think if you disconnect, it uh, creates a value uh, uh, that, that you can't quite get if you're constantly uh, uh, hoarding social connectivity. So, so basically those three things, fresh ideas, self-knowledge, and, and uh, connection to others, uh, all together makes up a kind of rich interior life 
And, and that's the thing that we're, we're in danger of, uh, of giving up on. I, I think when, when we spend our lives permanently, uh, connected to a crowd. Yeah. There's a lot to unpack there. Maybe we can talk about, uh, the first thing, the fresh ideas. Mm-hmm. I know that, you know, starting at least 10 or 15 years ago, there was a trend in innovative companies to put people into open collaborative workspaces. And in recent years, yeah, there's, yeah. there's started to be a pushback against that. I wonder if you can talk about, you know, this at least tension uh, between having people work and collaborate together to be innovative and creative and what you talked about as the need to have some, at least some isolation in order to develop fresh ideas. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I think that's exactly it. There, there's a strong tendency uh, to collaborate, and it goes all the way back to our school systems. Um, group work uh, really has a, um, a focus in a lot of elementary schools now. Um, and it, I, I, I think that uh, this tends to ignore a kind of thinking that is a little bit less uh, immediately productive, I would say, which is daydreaming. Um, you can't daydream as a group, right? Daydreaming <laughs> has to happen uh, as an individual. Um, what we're what we're finding now, daydreaming has sort of got a bad rap. Um, but what we're finding is that those moments of staring out the window, those moments of being waking up and lying in bed and your mind wandering, or or kind of being a bit dreamy in the shower in the morning. There's a reason that we get eureka moments in, in, in that interstitial space between uh, waking and sleep, right? There's a, uh, there's a set of brain functions that has been, is now called the default mode network. Um, and the DMN, the default mode network, is the set of brain functions that turns on when your conscious mind drops away. So it, it turns out that when you're daydreaming, your, your mind, your, your brain is actually incredibly active. It's just that uh, a, a curtain has fallen between uh, your ego, your, that I, and, uh, and the work itself, which is why a eureka moment seems to uh, come as if from nowhere or out of the blue, mm-hmm. right? So that's the... Uh, the, the real advantage to, to disconnection, I, I think, it, as far as fresh ideas goes, um, that you open yourself up to the potential of, of um, uh, uh, a bolt from the blue. And if I remember correctly, I believe the actual original Eureka moment that Archimedes had was in the bath, wasn't it? <laughs> exactly, exactly. He wasn't sitting at a dinner table talking with friends, right? Uh, and, and, you know, this is not to say that talking with others or, or engaging uh, with alternative opinions isn't important. Of course, it's massively important. Uh, it, it's really, again, about crafting that diet. So, so I think everybody, whatever their work is or what, uh, wh- whatever their task is, they have to begin by deciding how much of this is going to be served by connecting with others and how much of that thinking really needs to be uh, me processing it as a, as a private individual. So uh, w- one way you can think of it is, is uh, the, the tower and the field. So you go into the field to meet with others and then you retreat to your tower and then you go back out into the field and, and back to the tower. And, there, and it's the dynamic between connection and disconnection that seems to produce the most interesting uh, new ideas. So uh, collaboration with a a big dollop of isolation on top of it. And, you know, whether it's artists or or theoretical physicists or anybody who's doing any kind of creative brain work seems to have a habit of, of building some isolation into their lives. Yeah, it struck me as a major theme in in your books, this need to restrike a balance that we've swung too far in one direction towards Mm -hmm. connection. Um, And that it's not, of course, that you're suggesting that we 
only be isolated, but we need to find re- regain or find a new balance. And I'm particularly interested in asking you about uh, your suggestions for how we do this in the connected lives we actually lead. I know you're. I know you're not suggesting that we you know, move out of the city necessarily, if that's where we're living, but that we find some way within, you say, within the city, inside the crowd, inside our busy lives to find stillness. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, you know, in in the book, I do spend one week um, alone in a cabin, just so, you know, because I felt I had to do something like that uh, if I was going to be talking about solitude. But it, that really isn't the point of the book. As you say, it's about discovering solitude from within the crowd. Um, I, I, don't, uh, I, I don't think we need to become hermits at all. I, I, I really think uh, that a, a walk uh, along the seawall or even a, a, a walk down a crowded street can be an access point to solitude if you have uh, made a, a practice of this. So it, it's like everything else, it's on a spectrum, right? If you're standing in a grocery store lineup and you have a minute of free time because you're waiting for the person in front of you, do you dive into your phone or do you, I don't know, rehearse the first 10 lines of Paradise Lost in your head? You know. You, <laughs> that that's a choice that we make every day. Yeah. To, to find opportunities within otherwise busy times to exactly access some stillness. Exactly. Yeah. We, I mean, I, I think, um, uh, we have a faculty for, uh, social grooming, which is always hovering at the back of our minds. Uh, and if you, if you go strictly by instinct, um, that that desire for social grooming will fill in any of those empty moments, right? And now that we have the capacity to never be alone in our thoughts, uh, unfortunately, we now have to be proactive about designing those empty spaces, whereas previously they would come, uh, they would come unbidden. Uh, because, you know, you, you would be out and about and you didn't have a phone to fill it in with. Um, uh, I, th- I think this speaks to the, the idea of boredom. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people that I spoke to while I was working on these books, um, they talked about being bored as children and, and uh, how important that was to them. Um, and I, I think a lot of children growing up in the 70s and and uh, 80s, at some point they would complain to their mother or father that they were bored and their, their parent would then admonish you and say something like, if you're bored, you're boring. Or if you're if you're <laughs> bored, uh, you must not like the company you're keeping, you know, uh, and, and boredom was framed as a, a gateway to play or a gateway to inspiration or a gateway to creativity. Uh, whereas I think uh, we have a tendency now to think of boredom as um, a kind of anxiety that needs to be quelled. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I, I just ask readers to uh, look at uh, what they might be missing out on by by running away from their own company. Mm. Yeah, I don't have children, but it has struck me that it seems like uh, at the risk of generalizing, many parents today see see it as one of their obligations to prevent their children from ever being bored. <laughs> well, it, it, I mean, sometimes it, it's just a matter of practicalities, right? I, I have a lot of friends with small children uh, for whom uh, a tablet or a phone, a smartphone, becomes a kind of babysitter, um, and I, I don't blame them uh, necessarily, uh, but but I, I think it, you know, if if you've got uh, two parents working and 
you're trying to get something done and the kid is uh, screaming at you, it's a very easy thing, right? To, to put an iPad in front of a, a five-year-old's face. They, they become immediately docile. Uh, so, uh, it, it's, it's no wonder that, that we, that we begin, uh, we <laughs> get them hooked on it so early because it's an incredibly effective, uh, placator. Yeah. It seems like you're pointing out that both for ourselves and for children or other people around us, it's a become the path of least resistance and that in light of that Mm -hmm. we now need to be more proactive or make more of a active effort to and and a great comforter too right i mean over half of all americans now sleep with their smartphones on their bedside tables right um and the the excuse is that it's your alarm clock um but an alarm clock costs ten dollars, right? Uh, <laughs> and a smartphone costs seven hundred or so. So uh, the 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 phone becomes a kind of digital teddy bear, and and you know it, maybe it does wake you up, but then you immediately dive into your social media feed before you've even you know uh, said good morning to your partner. Uh, so. It, it, it's not only, I just want, I just make that point because I, I don't think it's children alone. I think we all um, have taken a great deal of solace from, from our phones. Yeah, it certainly is very comforting. I find that. And I, I wonder what you would say to at least two different types of people, you know, those of us who did have some experience before this new age mm-hmm. And and to those who are young enough that they don't have any pre smartphone experience, how, how what would you say to them to perhaps give them some comfort or encouragement to even try being isolated when understandably it can feel uncomfortable or scary? Well, I guess I would encourage younger people to look at the experience of their elders as a sort of. Uh, a curiosity for starters, right? I mean, <laughs> there, there's a, it's a fascinating opportunity. We are living, um, we are straddling two sides of a Gutenberg scale moment in, in our, uh, technological culture, right? I mean, uh, if you, if you think of the, of Gutenberg's printing press as the last time that something in our in our media shifted so dramatically, um, the the printing press is invented in 1450, but it's not till the 19th century that uh, most Europeans are actually literate, right? So the effects of the printing press on, on a daily level um, aren't really being experienced for hundreds of years. Uh, whereas with uh, with the internet, um, the experience is being felt in the moment that it was invented on, on a generational level. Right. So it's, uh, it's really am- amazing. I think that you have people living today, uh, who remember life before the internet and people living today who can't remember life before the internet. That's an extraordinary, um, opportunity for communication. Uh, we were straddling two radically different mindsets in in a sense. So, uh, it's not to say that, um, uh, you know, I I don't mean this in a kind of finger wagging way, but just that, uh, (laughs) if, if millennials, uh, are able to look at those who were born before 1980, um, as, uh, even just an anthropological, uh, curiosity, um, mm-hmm. I think there's a lot to be learned there, um, and vice versa, of course. But uh, it, it, if you're if you're talking about future generations, there really is only one generation uh, that will have access to uh, to those of us who lived before the internet. Mm. Wow! Yeah, that's a, it's a great way of thinking about it. Uh, as as trying to find some way to adopt an attitude of curiosity 
Um, I know you did your own experiment for a week. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and, you know, about anyone else that you spoke to for the book or know about who's tried other ways of living, whether they be temporary, like your week in the cabin or more permanent, you know, to try to incorporate uh, solitude into their lives. Well, I'm, a lot of people I've spoken to have uh, had that uh, discovery that taking the smartphone out of your bedroom um, really does have concrete uh, effects on your life. Um, so, I mean, it, it, that sounds so boring to say, but it, it, it's amazing <laughs> how it uh, disrupts the rhythm of your day. Um, uh, just pushing your first online interaction, just one hour or two hours further into the morning um, has the effect of, I, I think, becoming conscious of online life as a mental option rather than the oxygen that you're breathing at all mm. times, right? It's, it becomes a hat you can put on and take off. Um, and, and, you know, to that point about curiosity, that's what I think is exciting about the life that we're living right now, that, uh, I, I want people to be able to experience all, all aspects of this, right. To, to be able to go into the woods and, and live offline for a month completely alone and start, uh, talking to their dead grandfather, um, uh, because there's nobody else to talk to, you know, uh, but then also mm -hmm. to be incredibly technologically savvy and to, to have a kind of um, polyglot um, experience of technology and, and of media. That to me is the ideal, as opposed to uh, becoming a kind of passive uh, uh, technology user. So the, when I think of all the people I've spoken to, um, the ones that I admire the most are, are the ones that have that polyglot status, the ones who um, are fluent translators of, of multiple um, uh, media environments. Who can move in and out of the use of technology in yeah. different ways and, and yeah. make it a choice, really. Exactly, exactly. I mean, when, when I think about people's work lives, um, to, to look at the work that, that you want to do and then choose the media environment that will produce the best version of that work. And maybe that means being incredibly online for two days out of the week and then being deeply offline for the, for the last three. Maybe it means deciding I, I maximize my output if I check my email only five times a day and batch process those emails, right? Um, and then also to ask yourself when, when a certain amount of connectivity is being imposed on me by my managers, by my educators, by my family, by, by any structure, um, do I agree to that imposition? Mm -hmm. um, or, or do I need to push back? Uh, like, I, I think about, you know, if you decide to be a vegetarian, uh, you, you don't simply eat meat because uh, you, you went out to a company dinner and they ordered you steak. Uh, you, you have to actually assert the diet that you have chosen to consume, right? And I, and I think that's going to be the next step for us now is uh, th those who have the luxury of doing so will begin uh, asserting a healthier media diet. Well, it's very interesting. I mean, for a long time, I've been a big proponent of taking individual steps like you're talking about uh, to try to create solitude and, and quiet. But at the same time, there's a there are limits to what each individual person can do. And I think you're talking about the need to engage in conversations with each other mm -hmm. about this and address, you know, both the social pressures and expectations perhaps yeah. of being connected. Yeah, exactly. I, I, uh, I think a lot of people are afraid to claim disconnection for themselves, uh, simply because we have, it's a social taboo, right? 
Um, it's in, in a way, it's the ultimate social taboo <laughs> to be <laughs> antisocial <laughs> on some level, right? To uh, we 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 tend to think if you are choosing to walk away, then you must be either sad or or mad, um, <laughs> and uh, you you do have to put up with um, a certain amount of of, of uh, how should we say, um, uh, and uh, maybe, maybe it's even anger from, from other people. If, if you have denied them, uh, their share of you, right. Or mm. what they see as being their share of you. Yeah. That if I were to say, I don't check email on Fridays or I only check mm. it from nine to 12 a day. Yes. I might have a fear of what other people's thought or response to that will be. And I think increasingly the, the fear is localized around your ability to get to make a living, right? Um, the it, I mean, gosh, what what was the latest number? I think it was, uh, I think something like half of um, North American workers will be in some way freelance by is it twenty thirty something like that? Mm. Um, so the the precariousness of uh, of employment, um, makes us desperate to, to not upset anybody or to not be difficult. Right. Uh, so if somebody messages you on the weekend about a work project, you do feel compelled to get back to them, even though it's Saturday at 11 AM. Um, mm -hmm. that actually happened to me just this weekend. Somebody messaged me, I ignored the first message and then they were in a kind of tizzy and they messaged me again, <laughs> uh, you know, and it was something that probably could have waited to Monday morning. Um, but because it was a, a freelance project that I was engaged in, I, I didn't want to be trouble. So I, so I did interrupt my, my time away and responded to that person. Um, and I, and I just, I just hate that more and more people, uh, are, are placed in those positions of precarity where, where they don't feel comfortable saying no. Yeah. You know, I find myself on both sides of this. I'm a lawyer. I have a private practice. I have clients. Mm -hmm. I need to retain them and I need to get new clients. And I think I feel it most when we get contacted by a potential new client, right? I have the fear right. if I don't get back immediately, so they'll hire someone else. Yes. And uh, what one thing I've tried to do in my own <laughs> small way is that when I'm the customer looking to evaluate multiple companies or people to hire, mm -hmm. I try not to impose that pressure on them. Right, right, right. <laughs> I say if I were on the other side, I'd when I am on the other side, I don't like feeling that pressure. So I'm going to try as a consumer not to impose it on others. And I, I guess what you could also be doing is uh, changing the power dynamic a little bit so, so that uh, you are deciding whether or not to take on a client based on the kinds of demands, right? I mean, and I, I, I know that's a kind of luxury that not everybody has um, saying yes or no to clients, but to the extent that we have that luxury, uh, uh, you know, th th there's a larger macro uh, project that that you can be working on in in designing a stable of clients that uh, allows you to do your most thoughtful work, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I really like your suggestion because it asks us to really question our own belief question our own fear. Mm -hmm. um, do we, do we, it may be real, that fear may be real, mm -hmm. but you know, what are the other steps we can take perhaps to shift our environment or our situation, even if we have limited control over right. it? There's a kind of arms race that takes place, right? Um, and if you don't take that step back, like you're describing, you can, you can end up, I mean, just to mix metaphors here, you can end up like that, you know, the lobster in the pot of water that doesn't realize it's being boiled because <laughs> it, it, you know, there's, it's the shifting baseline. It, every, I think everybody has felt this, the, 
every year, it seems there's just a little more asked of you, just like maybe check your email one more time. And mm -hmm. uh, if you don't take that time to uh, audit uh, how you're spending your days, uh, then I, I think I think you can get very far uh, in, into the the boiled lobster experience before before <laughs> uh, you realize what's happened. Yeah, uh, we all do find ourselves very much wrapped in the experience or wrapped up in the experience. Mm -hmm. And if we don't take the time to at least some of the time step back from it, and I guess you would say take that step back in isolation. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, and uh, my partner is a, a regular meditator. He, he meditates every morning and um, we talk a lot about that idea of, uh, of detachment and, and the, the fear that goes along with it, the, the amount of, and I don't mean this in a religious way, but the amount of uh, faith that is required in detaching because you you really have to believe that it's going to be okay if you let go of of all those so-called responsibilities yes uh i mean i've tried uh to experiment with this with messaging let's just stick with technology mm -hmm. i have the fear that if i don't respond something bad will happen yeah. a person will think poorly of me i'll lose a customer and so i've just tried uh, for a half a day or an hour, whatever the amount of time is. And I have to say, in the vast majority of times, my fear was unfounded. <laughs> yes. And, and you know, there, there have been several studies uh, showing us how messaging creates messaging, right? Uh, so in, in an attempt to put out the fire of, of some email, you end up creating three new emails. Uh, it it, it reminds me of that that old saying um, or, or that old line: um, "The bureaucracy has expanded to meet the expanding needs of the bureaucracy." Uh, <laughs> it, it, we're kind of living in a, a a connectivity version of that, right? Where mm -hmm. we have to message more because we're messaging more, and and you you have that moment of fear when you walk away. But like, God, the, the number of times that I've taken a day off from email and then come back and seen a really frantic email chain where something was wrong. And then an hour later, they write me to say, Oh, I figured it out. Never mind. Right. <laughs> I, I think that, uh, a lot of, a lot of messages would, uh, would burn themselves out. Mm. So there, there may be some truth in the beginning to the, to the fear, but, uh, it may be that by taking that isolated time, it may uh, the cause of it may go away. Well, and I think you can you can invite people to try and figure things out for themselves a bit more often in in, in work situations. Um, there, I, I think, uh, especially uh, millennials, but all of us have. Uh, become very used to messaging somebody the moment that there's a question about anything in, instead of waiting to see if it resolves itself within the next hour or waiting to see if something becomes clear. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, this is perhaps a bit obvious, but fewer messages that are written with a little bit of remove uh, and the clarity that remove offers uh, are, you know, obviously, so much more um, uh, uh, effective. Hmm. You've given some really good suggestions to us for how we can try to find some and, or create some solitude in our otherwise busy lives. I wonder if you see any hopeful signs, either hmm. societal changes or technology changes. I know that Facebook, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is claiming that this year will be the year of change for Facebook, as an example. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, do you see any any positive trend trends or signs that people are recognizing the the value of what you've been talking about, and that we may be heading towards the pendulum swinging back towards balance? Uh, you know, I re I change on this almost on a day to day basis based on whether or not I'm feeling optimistic. Um, <laughs> 
when I'm feeling optimistic, I do think that there is uh, a shift in in awareness, uh, a, a shift in uh, in a certain set of uh, of social demands. Um, however, that's that feeling is usually tinged by a worry that ultimately it will be uh, the wealthy uh, and, and the upper classes who most are able to uh, demand solitude or demand mm. detachment in their lives. And, and I actually think that solitude, uh, that, that we, we are in danger of making solitude into a luxury good. Uh, and, and that uh, it, it's the disenfranchised and the poor who will feel increasingly compelled to feel or to be permanently connected to each other um, and, and, and to, to the world at large. Um, so, so I, I know that's a bit of a, a sour response, but um, the, my, my hope is that we find a way to safeguard a, a healthy level of, um, of connectivity for everybody. And, and my, my worry is, is that, uh, as I say, it will become a luxury uh, that few can afford. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if this is what you're talking about, but I, I've noticed, uh, let's say over the last 20 years, it used to be you'd go to a hotel and there was no internet and then there was an ethernet connection, then there was paid Wi-Fi and then there was free Wi-Fi and then it started to swing where now you can pay extra to have no Wi-Fi of <laughs> <that> sort. <laughs> well, well, exactly, exactly. I, I, I mean... Uh, I, I think most people are, are aware of this, uh, this experience of a kind of, there's a breakthrough, uh, moment where you become a little bit more comfortable, right? That's what, that, that was the term they always used to say, like, oh yeah, we're comfortable, meaning yeah. upper middle class. Um, and being comfortable now, I think means that you don't worry about when to check your phone. Uh, that, that you can experience daydreaming and disconnection, that you have the luxury of solitude, uh, because you aren't, uh, you aren't, uh, a cog in, in Facebook's wheel, or you aren't a cog in, in some, uh, uh, work-based email chain. Uh, I, I, I worry about that a lot. And, and, there's a certain degree to which uh, people can make personal choices about this to try to craft that healthy uh, diet to, you know, we, we, we can all stand to uh, not be looking at our Twitter feed as often as we do. Um, but then there's another level at which connectivity has become uh, not just de rigueur, uh, but actually mandated uh, by the state and by employers. Mm. You know, one thing I've done in my own life and I, I've see other people doing is um, uh, going back to uh, connecting with each other in person mm -hmm. more and in smaller <laughs> groups, you know, not quite isolation, yeah. but, you know, with small groups of people that feels more isolated and is detached from technology for a while it's happening. Right, right. Uh, and I mean, this is something uh, that I I'm constantly uh, hoping for in my own life. My partner and I, um, uh, we we almost never go out to restaurants anymore. We always try to have two people uh, at home uh, for a dinner. Uh, you know, for the very uh, basic reason that we can carry on a conversation better. Um, we're not mm -hmm. shouting at each other. Um, and, and those kinds of face to face, uh, uh, relationships, um, I, I prize them more and more. Um, and that, you know, to that point, uh, we mentioned briefly at the, at the beginning of this chat, um, connecting with other people, 
does become more possible and and more uh uh more likely i think it, if uh if we take the time to disconnect mm -hmm. yeah that's really great i mean disconnecting to reconnect to ourselves to reconnect directly to the others around us and that we don't always need to use technology to do that well and, and you know we're, we've all become very aware now of how toxic public discourse becomes when there are millions of faceless um avatars uh uh chatting on 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 social media right and so uh you, you know th there was a set there was a, a psychological uh idea i think it was called the car bubble uh where people became cruel to each other uh, when they got behind the wheel of a car because of your your windshield, because you felt, even though that person was only 10 feet in front of you in, in traffic, you felt they weren't really a person. They were an abstraction of a person. And therefore, you could you could honk and swear at them and, and behave in a way that you would never uh, think of doing if, if that person were standing next to you on, on a sidewalk, right? And I think that that, right. that same car bubble effect has been uh, uh, multiplied tenfold when, when we go online. Mm. So, I mean, you talked about some of the benefits of solitude before enabling us to have fresh ideas, connect better to people. And this last one strikes me as something that uh, perhaps connecting directly with people in smaller groups you know, actually could help cultivate some compassion towards people directly. Absolutely. I, you know, I, uh, I, I don't know how much stock I, I put in studies these days because they seem to prove everything and nothing all at once <laughs> um but but there have been studies uh arguing that um empathy levels have been uh dropping a, a great deal um and that and this seems to be tied to um a generation that has grown up um online uh, mm. uh there there's an mit scholar sherry turkle who's done a great deal of work looking at uh, uh, the, the ways that um, uh, millennials and teenagers are uh, in some ways afraid of face-to-face uh, -face conversations or shy away even from a voice-to-voice -voice phone conversation because there's an element of chaos to that. There's, it's such a rich and three-dimensional exchange when you're dealing with a human being right you're you're aware of the history of that person's body and, and and the um the all of the nonverbal cues that are that are emanating from that person whereas if if you abstract something into a purely digital conversation on your phone uh feelings become emojis and sentiment becomes text right and that's much safer much easier to deal with so so i think part of that drop in empathy or that increase in toxic public discourse uh it it's related to the the uh simplification of discourse people mm -hmm. become uh good or evil and, and they cease to be uh round or, or, or three-dimensional characters mm. um, because they've, they've literally become flat abstractions on, on a phone or on a screen. Mm. Yeah. Person-to-person -person interactions are messy. <laughs> They're super messy. And, and I mean, this is something we find so often. And there, and, uh, and, and there are people uh, working on this today, which we can get into later. But um, when you take people who have ideologically opposing beliefs uh, who have been swearing at each other online for for months and then you throw them in a room together and make them actually deal with each other as humans they might never completely change their minds but the the discourse just radically transforms you you know we we're in, in a beautiful way we are hardwired to empathize with each other when 
we're put in a, in a circumstance where we can't get away from each other's actual humanness, right? Uh, yes. there, there's a brilliant um, Black Mirror episode that uh, we watched uh, actually just last night uh, where uh, I think it's in season three. There's a lot of soldiers that uh, are uh, uh, being trained to, uh, to kill genetically inferior humans. And in order to do this, they've been given basically a chip implant that makes the humans look like monsters, right? Uh, and and it, it, that, you know, we're very familiar with, with this, uh, this idea that you have to dehumanize a person before you can be a, a cruel person toward them. Um, uh, th- this is something uh, that we, we see every day online, I think. Um, the the flattening of human experience is is a kind of uh monster mask that you put on top mm. of other people and it allows you to treat them like like they're not people yeah i learned about an organization a couple of years ago that i'm not involved in but it's called living room conversations mm-hmm. and uh i may, it sounds like you know about it but for those listeners who don't know they bring people i think typically within the same community uh, but who might be very different religions, political affiliations, you know, together literally into a living room right. to talk to each other with a facilitator. The idea being exactly what you said, that when you take human beings and put them physically together to talk, uh, often they can connect with each other in ways that they might not have thought was possible given their political or religious or other differences. And and th- this speaks to uh, the filter bubble problem, right? That has very much been in the news ever since the election. Yes, yes. You know, and it's interesting because we've started out talking about solitude and isolation and we've run the gamut. You know, I think this goes to your your balance point, you know, that uh, you're not suggesting, as you said, that people become a hermit. There's a place for isolation. There's a place for online communication. There's a place for small, intimate communication amongst small numbers of people. It's all part of life. Yeah, and and choosing how you want to be in the world instead of allowing a a set of, uh, frankly, profit-driven technology companies (laughs) to make those choices for you. That's really great. I'll take that as a great point on which to end, you know, that that, uh, maybe as our next phase of evolution, people can start reclaiming their ability uh, to choose how to interact with each other and to be alone. I hope so. Great. Thanks so much, Michael, for being on the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for joining us for this Technology for Mindfulness podcast with me, Robert Plotkin, and today's guest, Michael Harris author of Solitude in Pursuit of a Singular Life in a Crowded World and The End of Absence, Reclaiming What We've Lost in a World of Constant Connection. If you liked today's episode, please leave us a review on iTunes and share the episode with your friends. Those and all other links are in the show notes. And check out our blog at technologyformindfulness.com for information and tips about science, technology, and mindfulness. I'm Robert Plotkin, and I'll join you next time on the Technology for Mindfulness podcast with Dr. Larry Rosen, where we'll talk about the impact of digital technology on our mental health.